The military standoff at the Russia-Ukraine border has reached a fever pitch. In an effort to ease those tensions, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the Ukrainian president today. Meanwhile, Moscow has moved troops and equipment into neighboring Belarus for joint military drills. Today, Blinken said Russia has two choices in the tense standoff, diplomacy or confrontation. We have uh, tried to make clear that there are two paths for, uh, for Russia. Uh, there is the path of diplomacy and dialogue to try to resolve whatever differences there are uh, peacefully through diplomacy. Clearly the preferable path, clearly the most responsible path, and the one that we would prefer. But there is also the, uh, the path, if Russia chooses to renew aggression, uh, of, uh, of conf confrontation and consequences uh, for Russia. And we have been working to build out both of those paths in very close coordination and collaboration with, uh, with allies and partners. Christina Ruffini has been closely following this story, and she's here now to talk more about the possible outcomes of the standoff. Uh, so, Ruffini, it's so interesting. Russia seems to be indicating that uh, where the United States uh, and Russia are right now is very similar to where we were uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, what are you hearing about how the U.S. views that threat? Well, it's a very interesting sort of political standoff, right? You have this buildup from Russia where you would think if, if Putin's actual goal was an immediate invasion of Ukraine, he could have just gone ahead and done it right now. Instead, there's been a lot of signaling, a lot of buildup. You know, they're moving these forces in full visibility of the U.S. and European allies. They want something out of the U.S. They want something out of Europe. But even high-level diplomats are saying it's still unclear exactly what Putin's objectives are in this case. Now, the other thing that's really worrying American diplomats is this closer relationship between the troubled president of Belarus, who needed Russia's help to hold on to his office, and Russia, because now Russia can not only move in troops through Crimea, up through the Eastern Front, but they now have the ability to come down from Belarus and that's much closer to the capital, Kyiv. So obviously there's a sense of urgency, there's a sense of, of uh, just kind of a gridlock where they keep having these talks and they keep saying the same things over and over again that, you know, Secretary Blinken has said probably five times in the last day, we prefer diplomacy, but we are prepared if Russia chooses the other path. But no one can quite say what path Russia is going to choose. Mm, that is a troubling development. Uh, the point you make about Belarus uh, and Lukashenko drawing closer to, to Putin, uh, Christina. Um, so how would the United States and its allies respond if there was an invasion? Well, the U.S. has said, President Biden has said, we're not going to send U.S. forces into Ukraine. Now, we might send U.S. forces to other NATO allies in the region, and we're sending military support. The U.S. just sent $200 million more million worth of military support to Ukraine. The U.K. is doing the same thing. Other nations are considering it. But there isn't a real appetite to send ground troops in to back up Ukraine. And that's because, as you know, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So it's not bound by that mutual defense Article 5 treaty, and nobody really wants to get involved in a ground war in Russia that doesn't tend to end well for anyone going back centuries. So everyone is putting all their hopes at this time on a diplomatic solution. But if one can't be found, the U.S. has threatened economic sanctions and huge consequences. They say Russia hasn't seen anything like it before. But it's unclear if economic sanctions, even really sweeping ones, would be enough to deter Russia should it want to invade. The other issue with sanctions is you have to get everyone to agree or they're ineffective. So even if they can get all the European and other allies to agree on financial sanctions, you know, blocking Russia's access to international banking, things like that. The other thing the U.S. is trying to do is technical sanctions. They're trying to keep Russia from getting microchips, uh, high-tech products it needs to produce weapons that it sells and uses for a lot of its revenue. But this is a globalized society, and just because Russia can't get it from, you know, all the allies who are playing nice with each other doesn't mean they couldn't get it somewhere else, even if not immediately in a, in a short term. So, Christina, I know that um, a lot of the news has focused on the U.S. perspective and, and in sharing the perspective that the United States says Ukrainians share. In other words, uh, an urgency for, for democracy. But give us a sense of the Russian perspective here. Um, why does Vladimir Putin see Ukraine as integral to whatever it is he might be trying to accomplish? How does he see that part of the world? And how does he view NATO? I mean, we, he, he's pretty much on the record as to how he views NATO. But why is Ukraine the fulcrum? 
Well, the Russian argument is that Ukraine, especially the Crimean Peninsula, is historically part of Russia, right? It was part of the greater Russian Empire. It was part of the Soviet Union, and they want it back. The Ukrainians have said, hey, you know, we've all moved on. We have new borders. This was our border, and you crossed it, and we want you out. Russia is also saying over and over again that it is sensing a threat from Ukraine. It's, it even it, it mentioned this, this new $200, worth, $200 million, excuse me, worth of military support from the U.S. is saying that's a sign of provocation. It's it's saying NATO is making signs of provocation. You know, a Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, after she met with her Russian counterpart last week, said in her press conference, you know, she almost goaded Putin's masculinity, saying, you know, I don't understand why basically so big Russia is threatened by tiny Ukraine. Militarily, there's no comparison. The Ukrainian army is much better than it was a few years ago, but it's nothing to match one of one of the biggest forces and the, you know, if not the biggest, the, the second biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. So it's 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 unclear why Putin thinks the argument that he's being threatened by Ukraine is a valid one. There is a threat, however, Russia has always felt to NATO, which from the beginning, as we've talked about before, before Vlad, the very first NATO Secretary General, said its goal was to keep Germany down, Russia out, and the U.S. in. So it has always been there to counter NATO. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, it kind of didn't feel like it needed that purpose anymore. It pivoted. It got involved in, in the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. But as Russia has come back, and we've seen Putin kind of go on a little bit of an adventure other places in Europe, you know, Georgia, Ukraine, now Belarus, there is a concern that NATO needs to get back to its original issue, and that's countering Russian aggression, ag aggression, excuse me, it's been a long night, countering Russian aggression in Europe. And that's something we're seeing for a group of allies that have not always been on the same page the last couple years. Uh, we're seeing all the NATO allies really speak with one voice about this. They are concerned that it's not just about Ukraine, it's about the rest of Europe. Yeah, and you make an excellent point about the historical ties between Russia and, and Ukraine, Christina. And I know that, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, many Ukrainians supported uh, Vladimir Putin um, or felt uh, some sort of draw to, to Russia. But that has certainly changed uh, in just the last three or four years. Um, and so when the Secretary of State uh, meets with the Russian foreign minister uh, on Friday in Geneva, what are they, what is Blinken hoping to get from that meeting? Well, before we just thought, I want to go back to something you said about the changing perspective in Ukraine. Yeah. You're right. About a decade ago, it was much more split, and, and the whole population wasn't overwhelmingly in favor of joining NATO. Right. With Russian aggression, it's almost backfired, and those numbers have crept more in favor of NATO. Not only that, but there's an interesting thing happening with the language. When I was there for Zelensky's election a few years ago, my translator spoke equal parts Russian and equal parts Ukrainian because in the eastern part of the country, it's mostly Russian. Zelensky actually used to speak mostly Russian. And there's a lot of mixture because it, it was a language that was common in Ukraine. We're seeing an active movement by Ukrainians, by Ukrainian government officials, by regular Ukrainians to speak Ukrainian more over Russian. Even people who spoke it at home are giving interviews saying, now I speak Ukrainian because it's a matter of national pride. Now, as far as what's going to happen in Geneva and Friday, I'm going to be heading to the airport here shortly, so hopefully I'll be able to chat uh, from there when we get there. It's really unclear. Secretary Blinken has said, look, you know, there was a lower level meeting last week. We think we're at the point where I need to meet with my counterpart. We need to discuss this in person. But he also said today, once again, they're not expecting breakthroughs because he said, just like he has to go back and report to President Biden, you know, his counterpart has to go back, Sergey Lavrov has to go back and report to President Putin. So neither man sounds like they're coming to this meeting particularly empowered to be able to make an agreement, to make a deal, but they're hoping a face to face a face-to-face -face meeting will help move what has seemed to be kind of a diplomatic impasse and a very dangerous one at that. It is such a fascinating, I mean, what's happening in that region. And when you look at a country like Ukraine made up of people who are ethnic, you know, Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian, Moldovan, Crimean, I mean, the, the, a lot of the history of Eastern Europe is, is tied up uh, within the borders of, of that one country. Um, so we'll see what happens on Friday. Christina, it's always great to talk to you about this. You bring such incredible perspective um, to these stories. We appreciate it. Thanks, Vlad. You too. Nice to see you.